what we want to take and generalize from these things. For example, in the last couple of them, I think, we have had a activity and a custom view. All right. As a general rule, the activity shouldn't do a lot of work on its own. And this is sort of continuing the thing that we did way back when I did my tip calculator. If you remember, when I did my tip calculator, I had a, a custom class that I created. I had a class I created for Meal. And I let Meal do the work of the calculation. All right. This guy here, the activity, think of that as the boss. And, and bosses ideally you know, facilitate communication and delegate responsibility. All right? And don't necessarily get in and do all, uh, you know, all the, uh, you know, not, not try to micromanage and do a lot of the stuff themselves. So if you look here, really, the activity, there, there's almost nothing in the activity. All right? We, we do what, we, what we've done consistently, that is we grab pointers to things on our page. We set our content view, we grab a couple pointers. And we create and add to the activity our custom view, the spot on view. And then we have some really just some housekeeping stuff. And the rest of the stuff happens on that, um, on, on our custom spot on view. So let's look at that guy. Spot on view extends view, all right, which means it's a kind of view. The spot on view is a view, all right, in terms of inheritance. It inherits, it inherits a bunch of things from it. It inherits a bunch of attributes and it inherits a bunch of methods. Now we're going to override some of those methods to make it our view. But it has everything that a regular view has. And what are the views that we've seen so far? We've seen a lot of different views. We have seen the, um, the layout controls are actually views. The layout uh, views are views. Uh, image views, text views, edit text views. All these things are, are, are views. All right? And we're simply making another one. And really, the activity has a collection of views. All right? The activity gets some of the views by setting the main content view as coming from our XML file here, which is right here. So from this, it gets the relative layout and the text view and the other text view and the linear layout and so on. It gets this other view by adding this view, our custom view, to the layout. Now, interesting thing here. I want to show, I want to see what... It's probably a better way to do this. Let's try it this way. The internet connection is going to be a pain. Actually, this is a view group. The layouts are view groups, which is another layer, layer between them and a view. So this inherits from a view group, right? Because a layout, if you think about it, is a view that contains other views. A text view doesn't contain another view. It's just the text view. An image view is just the image view. So 
Um, these layout groups, which again, it shows a list of subclasses, known subclasses, relative layout, and so, and, and so on, inherit from view group, which inherits from view. So it's a view, it's also a view group, and it's also the relative layout. There's a method on the view group to add a view to it. So that's what we're doing in that line. We're adding a child, and the index the position at which to add the child. And it's adding it at position zero. And I might experiment here, because I'm kind of curious what that means. I'm guessing what this is doing is this is sort of putting it on top of the other views, maybe? I don't know. I guess we could try it in, in C. Um, maybe not. Uh, I'm thinking of that as, I'm not, it's not really clear what it means to me to say the position um, that it has. So let's do an experiment. Let's plug this guy in. And let's change that to a 4. Let's add that view at position 4 just for laughs to see what it does, if anything. Oh, and my tablet is dead. Maybe not dead. All right, it's coming back. Alright, doesn't seem to have any effect on that, so maybe that isn't really like a position in terms of what's on top. Maybe it's just a position in an array or something that doesn't seem to have any impact. Anyhow, we'll go and change it back. Alright. Bottom line is the activity doesn't do much. It just is a holder for all the views and does some sort of general housekeeping and creates our custom view where most of the work is done. We reviewed this last time. This extends view. We're going to see an example, I don't think will be today, but um, probably next week, where I create my own custom view that extends um, an image view. It, it's, it's, an, it's a watermarked image. Uh, it, a watermarked image view. So like if you're a photographer and you want to display images within your app, you might want to have the images 
and you might want to automatically have the app put like a watermark on top of them like Mike Zeller's copyright or something like that. And I'll show you how we could write a class to do that rather than having to go in and edit each photo uh, to do that. That's the case where we're going to take that view and reuse it over and over again. In this case, we're not reusing this view. This is only going to exist in, in the context of this game. But it sort of delegates the main functionality off of the activity class and onto this guy. Um, we saw the queues last time. There's a queue for the animation. There's a queue for the spots. We saw some initialization where, again, we grab on the constructor, we grab pointers, we create a, uh, a handler to add the spots, and we set some other parameters. And if I'm not mistaken, where we were last time is looking at add new spot. All right. So as that new spot gets called, from the add spot runnable, which is a thread, and initially we have it being called as part of a loop, and we call the other thread so that we can do a delay and then call the thread to create the spot. We don't want all the spots to pop up virtually instantaneously, so we use this to sort of set a little bit of a delay in the thread to pause and uh, between adding the spots. So, when we run this runnable, we call add new spot, which in fact adds a new spot. Sets a bunch of parameters, randomly, randomly decides where it's going to be positioned on the screen, randomly decides if it's going to be a green or a red spot. All right. We set on each spot an on click listener, which is an anonymous class. We don't have a class defined. Remember, the other way we could do this is we could have de uh, de defined down below. A, a, an inner class that would be, um, you know, spot click listener or something like that. Here we're using an anonymous class. In other words, we're creating a new instance of on click listener and we're, we only have a, a little bit of code there. Uh, and that is when the spot gets touched, call the touch spot um, method. And pass it which spot got clicked. All right, so it knows which one got clicked, so it can then do some determination for the score. Was it a red one, or was it a green one, or whatever. We then add our view to the spot, or our spot to the view, rather, and we do this animate. All right. Now, let's look at this. What is a spot? A spot is... An image view. All right. New with some kind of view. It is an image view. So, we're chaining a function, a bunch of functions together. We're saying spot.animate. Whatever that returns, we're calling the x method of. Whatever that returns, we're setting the y method of. So we're chaining all these functions together. This is actually a very clever way to write some uh, concise code. Because what all these methods do, if we look at, if we look at um, the description of the function,
and we can do this to any view again. If we look, the animate method This animate method returns a view property animator. All right. Wow, that's kind of a mouthful. All right. What is what methods exist on this view property animator? Well, we could probably guess, right? We've already seen those. The view property animator returns or allows us to do the X method. Oh, yeah, the X method, the Y method, translations, scale X, scale Y, rotation, duration, all these things. All right? So, Let's make sure we understand what's going on here because this is a little bit tricky. The view class has a method called animate. All right. So I have my view, which in this case is a spot. There's a method on it called animate. What does this method return? It returns a view property animator. What does that mean? This allows us to set certain properties relating to the animation of this view. So, if I say, which I do, spot dot animate, then I say x, and I give it an argument. Then I say y, and I give it an argument. Here's what's happening. When I say spot.animate, that returns a view property animator, which is an object responsible for setting the animation properties on that view. So this part of the expression is going to create and is going to return a view property animator on which we can call other methods to control other properties. So, this function call happens and the view property animator object is created. And from here on, I'll put one line through it, the rest of these methods are being called on the view property animator for our view. And each one of these methods returns back itself. If we look, each of these methods that we have here, scale x, scale y, simply returns back itself. That allows us to chain function calls to that same object. All right? In other words, My alternative word for coding would be something like this. I'd have to say view property animator VPA equals spot dot animate. Then I'd have to say VPA X 
or I'm sorry, VPA dot X and pass it the argument. VPA dot Y and pass it the argument. VPA dot whatever the next method is and pass the argument. Because of the manner in which this happens, all right, because of the manner in which this happens, this code is written, I can do this with this very terse statement. This part returns the property animator, this first part, and the rest is just adding properties to that view property animator object. So I'm saying the X, I'm saying the Y, I'm setting the scale X, I'm setting the scale Y. I'm setting the duration of the animation, in other words, how long it's going to take. And then I'm setting a animation listener. All right? And we'll talk about the listener in a second. X and Y, what do you suppose that method does? Yeah, it essentially draws its path. It sets X and Y are actually the destination where the spot ends. All right. We randomly find the beginning spot and the ending spot. Or I'm sorry, the beginning X and Y. We also find where this ends. So this is what's known as a tween animation. Anyone familiar with the term a tween animation? A tween animation is where you specify a starting and ending point and the software controls everything in between it. So in this case, we define that we want the spot to start at the point x, y and end at the point x2, y2. The animation will take the path over, will take the spot from that one path to the other path based on the duration. So if we set a faster duration, it's going to move faster. If we set a longer duration, it's going to move slower. All right? But in that way, we don't have to write every step to say, move it, you know, two pixels, move it two pixels, move it two pixels. We simply say where we want it to start, where we want it to end, how long we want it to take, and it will go and do its thing. So we are setting the ending point here for this. Scale X and scale Y, what does that accomplish, us setting that? Makes them shrink. If you notice the spots as the game goes on, it gets smaller. Where do we set that? Well, somewhere up here. Oh no, that's actually a uh, that's actually a constant. The spot goes till it's twenty five percent. It's going to start at the full size. It's going to go at the end and be twenty five percent when it's done. Set duration animation time is how long the animation is going to take. Lastly, the listener handles events. All right. The on animation start event is less important. All right. I guess it's important. It's saving on the list of animators this particular animator. That way, if the game ends, we can cancel all the animations. Remember we saw up here, where was it? When the game finishes, yeah. When the game finishes, we have this to go and get rid of and cancel all the animations that may be out there running. So they're not out there running and expending resources and so on. So we can start with a clean slate. So I guess I, guess I misspoke before. This, this, um, 
this line is important because it allows us to go in and clear out of it if the game's over. On animation end, well, when we end, we can remove that animation because we're no longer performing it. But looky here. If the animation is ended and the game isn't paused, and that spot is still in our spot queue, remember we had a queue, what does that mean? It means we missed it. It means it went from being generated to going down to a quarter of its size, and then finally it disappeared. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to remove that spot. All right, provided that that spot still exists. In other words, if the animation ends because I clobbered that spot, we don't take points off for that. But if the animation ends and that spot's still around, then I miss that spot, in which case I'm going to go and I'm going to lose a life. All right. We have... Let's see. We have probably three more methods to look at in the view. And these are the three touch events that we can, that, or, or the three events regarding touching the, the screen that we can have. One of them is if we touch a spot what happens. One of them is if a spot disappears and we haven't touched it, what happens? And then finally, what if we touch an area that is not a spot? Okay? So, this on touch event is what happens if we touch the view but haven't touched a spot. If that happens, pretty simple. We play our sound indicating that we missed. We go and we subtract 15 times the level for the, um, uh, for the score. Uh, if I'm not mista mistaken, every 10 or so spots that you touch, it ups you a level or something like that. Every certain number of, of spots that you touch, we'll see that in a second, it ups you a level. So it takes off 15 per level that you hit but it's not going to let your score go below zero. All right. And then we display scores and we're done. All right. So that's what we do if we, if we touch someplace on the screen that is not a spot. If we touch a spot, again, notice that this gets past the image view of the spot that we touched. What are we going to do? Well, we remove that spot from the layout. We remove it from the list of spots. This is something, again, similar to what we did in the Canon game, if you remember. We actually have two things going on. All right? We have the visual spot that's on the screen, the image that's being displayed on the screen, but we also have um, the spot sort of behind the scenes in the queue of the spot so we keep track of the management of those appearing and disappearing. All right. So we remove it from both places. We remove it from our queue of spots wherever it happens to be in the queue. I guess that belies what I said the other day about a queue only taking off from the front. This takes out the spot regardless of where it, it, it was. I guess these represent the people that drop out of the grocery store line. All right. And then we remove it from, again, our queue and we remove it from our layout. We increment the spots touched. We increase our score based on that times factor. What do you suppose the factor represents? What do you suppose the factor represents. Well, let's go and look. It 
does, and that's going to come into play too, but that's not specifically what that factor is here. The spot factor is simply a multiplier, whether it's a green or a red spot. We actually look at the we actually look at what drawable it was used to get created and if it was created with the red spot we set the factor to 2. If not the factor stays at 1. So that's a piece of code that um, gives you more points for hitting a red spot than hitting a green spot. So we get 10 points times a level times a factor. The factor being the difference between a green and a red spot. The level being every certain number of spots you uh, get cleared uh, and go up to a new level so you get more points for it but you get more points deducted and we check to see if spots modulus new level equals zero. I think we talked about the modulus function uh, in this class that is essentially the remainder. So effectively every ten spots according to the, the comment would have to look and see actually what new level is and new level is 10 but I don't like this comment because it, it, it's hard code. the comment is hard coded as 10 spots we could change that to every six spots we go up a level all right simply by changing the variable up there the parameters up there all right in which case that comment would no longer be accurate and could could be misleading all right but what do we do Here's the part where we speed it up. We set the animation time for new spots to be 95% of what the time was before. So it's going to get faster. And provided we don't have the maximum number of lives that are allowed, we go and add a life. In other words, every 10 that you hit, you get an extra life added. All right? And we both add the image and we yeah, we add the image to there indicating the number of life. And we display the scores and lastly if the game isn't over we add a new spot. Lastly, if missed spot fires off, and how do we know we've missed a spot? We know we've missed a spot if the animation finishes and the spot is still in our spot queue. So that's how we know that we missed the spot. Well, if we miss the spot, we remove that spot from the queue. We remove the visibility from the screen. If the game's already over, in other words, this is just something that is happening because these things are happening relatively simultaneously, we exit. We play the sound effect. Not. Nah. What do you mean, what is an exclamation point? It means not. 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 So this is asking is sound pools not null? Not equal to null. Actually, yeah. Actually, to back up, this removes it. I was saying this removes it from the spot queue, which it does. This also remo removes it from the screen and... Where do I see? Where do we remove the spot from? Oh, way down here. We remove. All right. If the game's already over, we say it's over. If it's greater than the high score, we set the high score. We cancel the animations alright and then we build a dialogue that asks if we want to play it again otherwise if it's not over 
All right, here we go. We remove the spot from the life indicator. And you remember the life indicator is the little thing on the bottom that keeps track of the number of lives. And then we add another spot. And we continue until all those guys are done. Here's an interesting thing. How does this know when the game is over? It knows the game is over if there are no more images in that little section on the bottom of the screen. All right. In other words, not keeping a variable that says the number of lives that you have left. Those images that appear on the bottom are actually used to count the number of lives you have. It's not like they're simply displaying that down there and they're holding the actual value as an integer somewhere else. All right. They are actually counting, when you miss a spot, how many of those lives are in there. And if there's none in there, boom, you're done. All right. I'm not sure if I like that, but I'll bet you I know why they did that. I don't like that because it seems goofy. The number of lives that you have should be an integer, right? And we should, we should be able to display it any way we want to, right? We, in other words, we, we're right now we're showing three of those little dealies on the bottom of the screen, all right? Well, what if we don't want to show three of those little dealies? What if we actually want to show the number three lives or something like that? You'd have to monkey around quite a bit to change the program to do that. Well, maybe not quite a bit, but you'd have to play around to do that. I would prefer to have a, an instance variable that kept track of actually how many lives you had and then let the GUI handle how it's going to display it. All right, so we could display it as a number if we wanted to. We could display it as the little images or whatever we wanted to do. All right, so that's sort of the way that I would prefer to handle it. I'm guessing they did it this way because then they don't have to worry about consistency. They don't have to worry about keeping the number of little guys on the bottom of the screen matching some instance variable that holds track of how many lives they have. So I guess preference, six of one, half dozen of the other. Questions at this point? This is it is is giving the number one expressed in a certain way. If you use a one by it, uh, if you use a one by itself, it is considered to be an integer. This function needs a floating point number, so I'm using one f to indicate as one as a floating point number. All right. So that function, whatever it is, this function here, that last argument has to be a floating point number. If we put one, let's see if it will complain. I guess it didn't. But to answer your question, that explicitly makes this a floating point number as opposed to an integer. Other questions about this? Since we have a little bit of time and since we're talking about custom views and we've seen custom views in the last two, both the custom views that we saw sort of just extended the generic view. All right. So we were not starting with any particular kind of view and building off of it. We were starting just with the blank slate view and we were adding things to it. Um, what I like to do is I like to bring up 
um, I mentioned I did um, a little example for photography of how I could use a custom view to add a watermark to something. So let me go in here and import, if I have it with me, I think I do. look real quick to see if I have it online.
Ah, here we go. Good. What's the date today? Guess what day I did, I went over this example, fall of 2012. Today. No. Yesterday. Tomorrow. 1025. Hey, that, that kind of consistency, because I, I was looking through, I was scanning through the, the, the examples and, and, uh, and then I pulled it up. All right, here is the code for it. Let me run it in the emulator because I think my device died. I'll let it run in the emulator while we're talking. In this example, I have a custom view that I created called Watermark Image View. And if I look at my layout, Okay, this might actually be what you're running into. You can't see the main XML file. All right, and usually what I do, you can't see the GUI view. Usually what I do is I've, I've not experienced that. <laughs> oh, actually I'll bet you I know why this is not doing it. Okay, weird. That is giving me an error on that. I'm not sure why. If I do what? Going to. Yeah. to your project and clean okay
no luck. Fortunately, I got this round before it looked before it got dirty. <laughs> and if you see, there's pictures that have the watermark on it. All right, and we can look at the code even if we, we unfortunately we can't run it again, but um, we can we can look at the code in my main XML. I have a relative layout. Then I don't have what we've used to been seeing with views. We're, uh, we have instead my customized view, which is my path to that particular view. Now, because it's a view and because it's an image view, it has all the properties that an image view has. So, what are some of the properties that an image view has? It has an image, or it has an ID. It has an actual image from the drawables folder. So there's the image from the drawables folder. It has a layout width, a layout height, and all those sorts of things. But, these MZ colon X, those are the parameters for the properties of my class, my custom view. So because it's a view, and because it's an image view, um, I can set all the properties associated with an image view. But because it's my custom image view, I can set some of my own properties all right, associated with it. So here I set my X property, Y property, that's simply the position of the watermark on it, and then I have a size of the watermark. All right. So, the page doesn't do anything except pop up the view. Again, it's a good boss that doesn't really do a lot. Oops. And my watermark um, image I pull the parameters all right I extend the image view notice how in previous examples we just extended the view I have my default properties all right I have some constructors Then, I use a new resource, the stylable resource, to get my properties from the XML into this class, or into this object. All right? In other words, if you remember, when we have a view, when we have an ordinary view, or an image view, or a text view, or whatever, we set some properties in the XML. When that XML gets inflated, the object we create, has those properties. Well, Android knows about those. That's part of its own framework. This is our guy. We have to tell our guy how to map the properties from the XML to the actual attributes of the object. So, we do that via r.stylable. Maybe that's what does the mapping of it. It's been a while since I've seen this example. That R stylable means from the XML file for watermarked image view, the X property. So we grab that, all right, and we default it to 10 if it isn't there. Now, the other thing we do is, again, remember that we can override methods. All right. So, the method that draws an image or any view on the screen is the onDraw method. All right. So, I call the onDraw method of 
the ancestor, which is the image view, and that's what gives me the actual image itself. Alright? The picture, not the watermark. This code is what draws that text watermark on top of it. So I've ex because I've extended the on draw, and I've overridden the on draw, alright, for this, I call the super to do the regular image sort of drawing behavior. That draws the image on the screen, draws the image of the bird on the screen. I then add some additional commands to go and actually draw my watermark. And what do I do? I, I create a paintbrush, and we'll get more into this um, next week. I'll make sure I get this up and running. Um, I transferred this from my other machine. It was probably running another, different SDKs and all that. So that's probably where the errors are coming from. But <clears throat> I'll get this cleaned up and we'll review it on Tuesday. But essentially, every view has a canvas associated with it. And the canvas is what you draw on. To draw on a canvas's view, or I'm um, sorry, to draw on a view's canvas means that you're going to change the way that view looks. So here, I'm drawing on that canvas, and what am I drawing? I'm setting a paintbrush to set the color. 255, 255, 255 means white. What do you suppose that 200 means? The opacity, right. So in other words, if we look at this, Notice, and it might be a little hard to see on the screen, but those letters are somewhat transparent. And I can control that by setting that first um, property. Oops. I set the style of my paint. I set the text size that I want based on that property that I set in the XML file. Then finally I go and I draw this piece of text on there. Mm -hmm. It's actual letters. So you still have to paint even if you're... Yes. Text. Yes. Yes. The, the mechanism for doing that is... And again, the paintbrush, or, or the canvas rather, think of the paintbrush as being like, you know, your marker. Alright? And what can you do with a marker? You could write letters with a marker, you could draw a picture with a marker, or whatever. All right, so that's just setting what you're going to do. All right. I could draw a rectangle on here, on the canvas, and then it would draw a rectangle with those paint properties. All right. But I'm not drawing a rectangle. I am drawing text. So that's what puts those letters on there. Shame on me for what in this example? for having the text hard-coded, all right? Should be coming from a string file because um, were I to internationalize this or were I to do something for a bigger screen, all right? Maybe I have a bigger watermark for a bigger screen, all right? Um, I wouldn't be able to do it this way. That's actually a good thing for me to look at for next time. Maybe I will make a bigger watermark on a bigger screen device and a smaller watermark on a, on a smaller screen device. All right. Or we could try different languages or whatever. But I do want to get back in the practice of looking at the resources file. We'll look at this again once I get the errors cleaned up and we can play with it. Um, looking at the code, um, it's always a good thing and I encourage you to do this with any of the examples, to take them and tweak them just to see what happens. All right? You know, what happens if you change the random number function to generate more red than green dots? Does it work the way that you'd expect it to? All right? It's a good way to sort of learn a program is to think about, like, things that you want to change. Go in and change the things that you think are going to affect that, then see if it does or not. If you can change the things that you think are going to affect something and it actually affects something, then you're probably on to something. 
All right. If you're changing things and nothing's happening, or opposite of what you're thinking is happening, then um, you know. Well, you got you, you, you know you got to revisit it. Let's see what shapes are available. Android canvas draw shape. Canvas class has its own set of drawing methods you can use, like draw a bitmap, draw a rectangle, draw shape. Let's see what. I always go to this for two reasons. One, I legitimately don't have all this stuff memorized, so I would have to look it up. And number two, it pays to practice learning how to read these Java docs. When I first used this, and this is a, this is a, a classic format, a lot of Java documentation is done this way. When I first started with this, I couldn't tell heads or tails from this. I look at it and it's like, and, you know, the answer's, you know, it's like the answer's in there, but where? It, it's a skill like anything else. It takes some time to go and practice it. So, like to answer those questions, we can go and look and say, alright, what are some of the things we can draw? We can draw we can fill the entire canvas with a color. That's one thing we can do. We can draw an arc. We can draw a bitmap. Bitmap being a, a, um, a matrix or an array of points and colors. We can draw a bitmap on a particular screen. We can draw the blah, 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 blah. We can draw a circle. We can draw a color. How's that different than draw a... Uh, oh, um... We can set an opacity here. It's a different, similar but different way to do it. Another color, we can draw a line. We can draw an oval. We can draw a path. We can draw a picture. By drawing a picture, we could go and instead of, you know, how do I want to put this? Um, I could put a little picture of my face next to the words in the watermark on top of that other image if I wanted to. So I could draw a picture. I can draw a point. I can draw points. I can draw text. I can draw rectangles. I can draw a round rectangle. Text on path, draw vertices, and so on. So there's a lot of things that you can you can uh, draw um, um, on this to, to answer your question. Um, now, what if there was something that you wanted to draw, and this canvas doesn't have a method to do it? What would you do? Get a new canvas. How do you get a new canvas? Write your own method for it. Right. But and and you could write it on a view if you wanted to. Alright. You, you, you could you could do this any number of ways. The point is, is if it's something you want to do frequently then make your own custom something for it. Probably your own custom view. All right? And your own custom view then, with that, um, you can, um, you could add methods to it that, or override methods, or add methods to do the things that you want to do customized. All right? The assumption in this case is there wasn't just one photograph that I wanted to put a watermark on. 
I could do that with, a, with an image view and I could code my app to do that. All right? The assumption was I want to crank these out. I might want to have a page with 50 thumbnails or 50 images, all of them having the watermark. All right? Well, what do I do? Well, it would be foolish to repeat that code over and over again, so instead we extend the framework. You know? uh, when we talk about a framework, we talk about it being a starting point. So the Android framework is a starting point for us. We can put our own custom things in. So we can extend the framework by putting our own code in, but we can also extend the framework itself by creating our own custom versions of these classes. So the image view didn't work for me. I created a watermarked image view that, that does what the image view does, but a little bit more. All right? And you could do that if you want to enhance the drawing of shapes or whatever as well. Oh, yeah, there's probably a bunch of ways you could implement that functionality, but the idea is, is you wouldn't like hard code it each time. You'd find a systematic way to do it so that you could build upon it. If, if you needed to draw rhombuses, for example, you could write a draw rhombus method or, or trapezoids or whatever. Other questions? All right, we'll see you in lab. These pictures, by the way, are between the, right before you get to, on the second floor, right before you get into the college center on that, little bridge that goes across. Every year, well, I can't say every year, the last two years, a robin has built their nest on top of the light. That the, uh, actually, our um, provost's office is like right here. Dr. Ballinger's office is right here. And this bird uh, builds its nest. This is from the first year when I had my nicer camera, so it's sharper pictures. Uh, I got Almost the same pictures this year. Couldn't tell if it's the same mom or not. But uh, I, I had to take them with my phone because my, my digital SLR bit the dust. All right. <laughs>